So thank you so much for having me. Um, I am very excited to be here and be able to talk to this group that I've learned so much from over the years, over my career. Um, this is hopefully a very lighthearted talk and turns out today is a very difficult day to give a very light talk. So if you, I, I personally have had a hard time focusing on what I'm going to be talking on since last night. But if you feel like you need the time to not listen to me today and to be doing something else, I found out that the keynotes are going to be recorded and posted. But if you're going to stick around, I hope you enjoy the talk and I hope you can join and interact uh, with me and the others in the chat as well. So um, the a title of the talk is my toolbox is full of shiny tools. Do I also need superpowers? And frankly, when I started working on this talk uh, earlier last week, I thought, what was I thinking with this title? But I think we have something hopefully enjoyable for you. Um, so if you know anything about me, you know that I love cats and hence the cat mask. You might also know that I know nothing about superheroes, hence my questioning myself about why did I think I should give a talk about superheroes. But um, more uh, relatedly to the point you, point, you might also know that I personally really enjoy playing with new and shiny tools. Uh, no pun intended there. Um, if there's a new um, statistics or data science tool or an R package or something, I usually love taking a little bit of time to try to kind of dig into it and play around with it and learn from it. Um, some people say, well, maybe you don't have any hobbies, Mina, but I do genuinely enjoy learning stuff like this as a hobby as well. Um, but the thing is, while it might be a no brainer for me and potentially uh, some of you in the audience as well to you know, just dig into something new and play around with it um, and take a bit of your time to do so, um, the decision to bring that stuff into the classroom, teach it or not teach it to your students, at what stage and how, that's a lot more nuanced and requires a lot deeper thinking than saying, hey, I just saw this on Twitter today, let me see what it's about. And hopefully in this talk, what I wanna talk a little bit about is going beyond the basics of what we might potentially all, or at least in majority agree on in terms of what we should be teaching um, um, to the modern statistics or data science student. And I'll put them in the context of superpowers. So the slides will look something like this. There's a superhero superpower on one side and a data science superpower on the other. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first one is graphic vision, or in other words, data visualization. So what do I mean by this? First of all, um, my practice and my recommendation as well, and one of the things that I think has been primary, uh, one of the primary reasons why I have felt like uh, data science courses that I've taught have been successful is that we start literally on day one with data visualization. In fact, I often have this sometimes unrealistic goal for myself of making students do a data visualization within the uh, first 10 or 15 minutes of the class. But beyond that, I think it's important to not leave things there and not leave things with the defaults and actually continue improving on students' data, science, uh, data visualization skills throughout the curriculum. as the curriculum of perhaps the first data science course, but also throughout the full undergraduate curriculum. So what might you be teaching data visualization for? The obvious one perhaps is to motivate inquiry and exploration, but it's also a great way to support multivariate thinking, which we all hopefully know that is a strong recommendation in the guidelines as well as um, how we really should be thinking about the world. Um, also to effectively communicate results and findings and frankly, to advance programming skills. I find that I myself actually learn a lot more about programming when I'm really trying to get a plot correct. Um, and finally, perhaps for aiding inferential decisions beyond the uh, tools that you might already have. So let's dig into this a little bit. The start with data visualization on day one might very well be something you've heard me say in the past. Um, generally, my practice is to prepare a ready-to-go computing environment for students, along with a reproducible document in there that has some code to produce a, a single visualization. And um, 
in that visualization, uh, we do have some code that we have not taught the students at all um, that might look somewhat foreign to them, but it needs to be some code that they can uh, that's obviously straightforward to modify for making uh, some sort of small customization to the plot. So one of the examples that I really like and keep going back to and in fact have kind of uh, taken over the role of maintaining this R package that has data from United Nations um, voting patterns so that I can continue to use it in my uh, teaching is making a visualization like this. We can see that we're looking at three different countries that we've selected, voting patterns on six different issues on the United Nations. And the choice of the countries is, you know, somewhat arbitrary, but ultimately what we want to uh, have students do is go into the code, even if you don't understand the rest, and which I have kind of redacted here to fit things into the slide, and change one of the countries with something else and um, render the plot again. And the idea here is to give them something to kind of um, interact with right away and create something new right away with a choice that they're making along the way. Um, the next steps uh, might potentially be obvious. Then we teach them how to actually make plots, how to make histograms and bar graphs and whatnot. Um, but we oftentimes tend to leave things there with the defaults, which tend to be pretty good if you're using ggplot2, but, um, you know, not the best. Um, there may be many other ways where if you are actually going to create a document for publication, whether it's a journal publication or, say, you're writing for a popular magazine, you probably want to tweak your a bit more. So I think it's important to continue to advance uh, students' knowledge in data visualization beyond the introductory course and actually give them some space throughout the curriculum to dig deeper into it. What are some ways you can do this? Um, one of my favorite ways of doing this is to give them these recreate this exercises that will advance programming skills. Here are a few plots that are made with ggplot2. That target logo, in fact, made with ggplot2 with a few lines of code. So giving students exercises like this where you might think, OK, is this the sort of thing that's best practice for data visualization? Maybe not necessarily. But the idea is these are not very easy plots to make. We have some emojis in one of them. Uh, we're doing a little bit of something generative uh, with the colorful flowers in the other one. And while well, the target logo speaks for itself. But the idea here is that it makes them Google things, it makes them look things up. It probably has them use aspects of the ggplot2 package that you may not necessarily be doing instruction on, but it teaches them um, to kind of um, learn on their own a little bit. And the nice thing about this is that they know exactly where they need to get at the end. So this is not a very open exploratory thing after all. They know when they are done with this sort of assignment. Another one is to recreate and then improve. So take some visualizations that are existing out there, maybe some that are not so good and maybe some that are good, and use these as tools to advance programming, but also communication skills. On one, uh, one of these visualizations, the 3D pie chart with so many little pie slices. We know that's not good practice. Well, let's have the students recreate it first, that's going to be the advancing programming skills thing, but then have them reflect on what would be uh, better, um, what would be better for communication, communicating these results, and then have them change up the plot. The other one is a plot from uh, a Pew survey, which I had not seen a plot like that before. So I thought, hey, I wonder if we can recreate this in ggplot2. And then actually, again, have the students reflect and um, uh, improve as well. And finally, going beyond the basics. Um, if you have created sort of, uh, you know, um, let's say a manuscript for journal publication, uh, chances are you've had to distill a lot of information into a couple plots and didn't get to be very liberal with where you scatter that information around. We rarely tend to push our students to that level, even when they're writing their thesis. So I would encourage um, making room in the curriculum to try to do that. This sort of plot, for example, is probably pretty common in published literature, tends to not um, appear much in data visualization kind of education, uh, because we tend to kind of teach data visualization early on and then leave everything open-ended for the student. So 
I found that trying to make room in the curriculum, either with a dedicated course or scattered throughout courses uh, like advanced level statistics courses or a capstone course to push students to create things like this can really advance their understanding of how do I communicate results with visualizations and take things beyond just uh, using visualizations to explore my data. And finally, inference. Um, you know, I think there was a time when many of us were just teaching inference using mathematical models. Um, now I feel like many of us um, either have completely changed our practice to make kind of simulation based inference uh, front and center, or at least feature that in some way in our classes. Well, there's a whole other type of inference, inferential techniques that you could be using, which would take visualizations beyond just exploratory data analysis and get students to start thinking about when I see a plot Thought, um, how do I assess if the relationship I'm seeing in there is real or significant or not? So uh, here we have uh, what we call a lineup plot uh, from the visual inference literature, where one of these is the real empty cars um, data set, and then the others have been randomly generated under the null hypothesis um, that there is no relationship between the weight of the car and the miles per gallon. Um, so in this case, um, we, you know, we can basically use tools like this uh, to kind of make visualization part of the tooling that we use for inference, as opposed to just part of our exploratory analysis or the communication stage of our uh, projects. Uh, the next superpower I'll talk about is shape shifting, in other words, data wrangling. So. Um, we probably all start data wrangling with summarizing the data. And then I would recommend once students are familiar with uh, kind of the data wrangling pipeline to move on to things like reshaping and tidying the data. Um, in, just like visualization, this is a great tool for motivating inquiry and exploration, but also a very useful tool for doing very real things like joining data from multiple sources, which oftentimes students need to do if they actually want to answer a complex question or to pre-process data for statistical analysis. So it gets into that nice rectangular format that we can then fit a model to, for example. So data wrangling for summarization, let's start with a very basic example. I have a data set and I am going to create, um, you know, um, a, some sort of a frequency table. The thing is, um, if you're using um, dplyr or the tidyverse for um, uh, finding these counts, uh, what you end up getting is not usually what we like to see um, as humans for uh, digesting this sort of information. Uh, I, I like seeing a two by two table. At the same time, I don't really wanna use the table function in R for doing that because I know that as a result, I'm not going to have a data frame anymore. And then that has its own hurdles associated with it. This is the sort of thing you could be doing in day one or day two of the course. But I, um, I think more and more so I've been trying to kind of wrangle further for better presentation. So instead of presenting um, those counts in the default way, take things one step further and make it an opportunity to teach another very handy function, like the pivot wider function in this case, to uh, put this um, in for the same information into a format that is a lot more human friendly, that's a lot more like what we like to see. And then if you were to pipe this into some sort of a function that would create a nice table for you, say, in your R Markdown documents, then you're good to go. You don't have to do additional copying and pasting of these counts to create a nice table for yourself. Um, data tidying, I talked about, um, you know, pushing things further for joining multiple data sets, but perhaps even more importantly, we need to be showing students data that maybe looks something like this. In this case, I have an excerpt from a JSON file. So this is a very common uh, way of storing data, um, both web data and not. Um, and I think that we need to be, um, you know, encouraging our students to think beyond the rectangle or actually start wherever they start and then think back to their rectangle. So teach them tools to basically take, um, an input data like this and then change its shape so that we can get back to that tidy format. I'm thinking back to uh, Rob Gould's talk from yesterday where uh, he was mentioning um, 
kind of this exercise they do in the intro data science course with uh, high school students um, in terms of um, how that tidy data format is not necessarily natural to them. Well, perhaps equally so, this sort of presentation is not going to be unnatural to our students, but we know that if we're somehow going to model these data, visualize these data, even make summary statistics tables from these data, we're gonna want this in that uh, rectangular tidy format. So starting with data that looks in different shapes and then um, teaching the tools to get it back to the shape and doing this over and over again will introduce um, the students to many different data structures, which is a good thing in general, but then also will provide an opportunity um, and good motivation for teaching some of those advanced dplyr or tidyr functions. Um, in general, I think an important thing to keep in mind is that the ecosystem of data wrangling is quite rich and quite deep and um, perhaps almost ever growing. And it's important to not think about teaching this ecosystem package by package, but instead motivate it with examples and teach the relevant functions from these packages uh, when they become necessary to accomplish the next task. The next one is telekinesis or data import. Uh, so what do I mean by data import? Yes, we can import CSV files, we all know that, but let's think beyond the CSV. Um, let's teach it to motivate discussion on data types, which can sometimes be a dry topic otherwise, and create make it an opportunity to harvest web data. So what do I mean by it might be dry? Um, if you were like me and have learned R maybe about a decade or so ago, um, or God, actually more than that, um, you perhaps have started with thinking about what are the various types of data, um, you know, is this a character string, is it logical, so on and so forth. And personally, I find that sort of discussion a little bit dry, um, but unless we have the right motivation. On the other hand, though, having to deal with unexpected data types after importing data is an incredibly common task, and I think a great motivation for uh, discussing this topic of data types and classes. So here is an example of, let's say, hand-entered data. We have some student names, their favorite foods, um, the meal plan they're getting, ages, and the socioeconomic status of the students. You can see so many bizarre things happening here. The header row is format, the formatting is all over the place. Sometimes we have NAs, sometimes we have 999s to indicate an NA. Uh, the age is sometimes handwritten or written out as a, and then sometimes given as a numerical value, so on and so forth. When we read this data in from this Excel file where the data have been reported, um, we can see very clearly that some of the data types are not what we would expect. We would expect age to be numeric, for example. So this becomes an opportunity to discuss what the various data types are, and then also to then go back to data wrangling and say, and here is how we can get ourselves out of this rut. So, um, in a way, we can kind of combine lessons on importing data and then the problems associated uh, generally with importing data um, into R with lessons around data types and data classes. And beyond that, um, beyond the rectangle, um, the web is an incredible source for data, but turning it into a structured format without copy paste or manual entry requires that you learn some new skills. You'll learn some new skills that will allow you to say, take a look at this table and then be able to figure out what the particular tag of this is in the source code so that you can import it into R. So I won't go into the syntax um, kind of details here, uh, but we do have a paper on this uh, with Mina Doja that I reference at the bottom where we actually go through this very example and um, kind of give recommendations on how you might teach data scraping off the web, um, even in an introductory data science course, even in the first course. And I think that opening students' eyes to not just the fact that data exists in these different formats, but here is tooling you can use to get that data into R is incredibly helpful and ultimately solves a big problem they tend to get themselves into at the end of a semester when they're working on an open-ended project. Um, the thing is, web scraping, or in other words, screen scraping, is one thing. Um, and 
frankly, um, it's the only thing I personally am able to fit into my introductory data science course in one semester. But data on the web does not end there. I think it's important for us throughout the undergraduate curriculum to make sure that students are not just thinking about getting data off the web as a web scraping or screen scraping exercise, but also understand that APIs exist and we can make calls to them and we can get data out of them. This doesn't mean this has to be a huge component of your curriculum, um, unless there's other reasons to focus on that. But say if you have a higher level computing course, or maybe part as part of a more advanced course, you might come back to this and say, hey, remember, we already learned one way of getting data off the web. Here is another way of getting data off the web. Just the mere just knowing the mere fact that this is one other thing they can engage with and they can um, kind of um, so that they have a mental model of what does it mean to authenticate and get data uh, can take them a long way and they can learn the details for other um, data sets that they might want to get off the web later on in their undergraduate career or beyond um, by themselves probably but that original pointer i think is incredibly important and finally um you know both of these basically offer a great opportunity for discussion on ethics and data privacy so it is not just about the computing but then also stepping back and saying hey we're getting data sometimes we're getting data about real humans sometimes we might be getting data that might be um private for other reasons um and so bringing this back to these discussions around which data should we actually be grabbing and analyzing uh, also adds another layer of richness to the discussion. Um, the next one is clairvoyance or predictive modeling. So um, chances are, if you have a machine learning type course in your curriculum, that's when predictive modeling happens. But I think it's important to not just leave this predictive modeling um, to the machine learning course and to introduce it, even at, if at a surface level, along with explanatory and inferential models. Um, we might teach it to actually introduce the idea of overfitting, uh, which we tend to mention uh, when we introduce multiple linear regression and maybe some things like measures like adjusted R square, even if we're only doing like explanatory or inferential models. Um, but then generally we don't tend to give great tools to our students to mitigate that. But this idea of them splitting your data into testing and training sets uh, can be one way of addressing this and it opens, opens the opportunity for them to kind of start thinking in that mindset. Also, uh, it allows for creativity with the notion of feature engineering. It presents an opportunity that goes along with the overfitting point of discussing an important concept like bias variance trade-off early on. Think, um, I myself probably have said and have sat in many presentations where we've said, oh, we should mention Simpson's paradox to students. I think this is an equally important concept for them to know early on in their undergraduate career. And finally, let's just be honest. Soon as you give the students an assignment to do an open-ended project where they want to find their own data sets, half of them want to do a classification problem. At least that has been my experience. And if yours have been different, um, that, 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 that's something else, but generally um, students like those sorts of questions, not all of them necessarily, but generally there's a substantial portion of the teams in my classes who wants to tackle something like this. So at some point I've said, you know what, I'm giving in, let's just actually cover this. This is important for you to learn anyway. Um, and um, and then if you want to learn more about it, obviously go and take a course that's more dedicated to going into the details of predictive modeling. So introduction of something I would say as big as this uh, requires, you know, very um, kind of uh, deep thinking about like, how are we going to do this in a way that doesn't overwhelm a potentially already a busy curriculum like the stat to regression course. Um, the way I've been doing this, um, and I know, um, uh, you know, many others in the community have been dipping their feet into it as well, is using the tidy models framework, um, which works really nicely if you're teaching everything up to the modeling point using the tidyverse, because now students are used to doing things in data pipelines, and this basically continues on with that. 
So Tidy Models, like Tidyverse, is a collection of packages. So this collection of packages is focused on modeling and machine learning using Tidyverse principles. The reason, one of the reasons why I like Tidy Models beyond the fact that the code, um, you know, it, it um, abides by the Tidyverse principles is that it comes with lots of guardrails and very informative error messages in it. So each of these Tidy Models pipelines will perhaps start with something like an initial split into training and testing data. But then the rest of the tooling that you're going to use gives you errors when you, um, you know, when you try to do something like a prediction on the testing data at the model and feature development phase, which you should be you know, keeping in your pocket until the very end. So I think those guardrails are helpful um, and um, kind of mitigate the fact that some of this code might be verbose um, because you're getting a nice and informative errors along the way. Um, the other thing I like about this ecosystem is that there are functions designed specifically for feature engineering that look very much like dplyr functions. So these come from the recipes package. And I think they motivate creative thinking during model development, which um, I think is enjoyable more than anything else, and also gives the students an opportunity to think um, beyond just the variables as given to them, but actually do so um, in a way where they're kind of looking at the data and really thinking about each of the variables and asking themselves the question of, can I do better with these columns that I have instead of, instead of using them on their own? And when we say, can I do better, instead of just, you know, perhaps take raising one to the power of two or something like that, actually going beyond and trying to perhaps extract more information or combine uh, certain uh, columns together. Um, I won't go further into this much here, but we did earlier in the week have a breakout session with Maria Tackett and Rick Pressman from my department on modernizing the undergraduate regression analysis course. So uh, there's a link to the materials there if you want to go back and review them and we kind of talk through the um, you know, the thinking behind uh, moving things or incorporating this into the regression course, uh, both in terms of the why and then also the how. Um, the next superpower is time travel, or in other words, version control. So what do we mean by this? Um, I think um, when I say version control, the first word that comes to mind is Git, using a system like Git to do version control. And oftentimes when we think about this, do in fact motivate it with the idea of uh, you know, time travel. You'll be able to go back to a particular point in your uh, work. Well. Um, Git comes with its own hurdles. It is not necessarily a very easy uh, system to learn. That being said, um, if you have a nice interface to it, either the Git pane in our studio or another GUI that you can use to interact with Git, things can be a lot simpler than typing out potentially um, kind of um, esoteric Git commands in your terminal. Um, I think that for teaching version control, an important thing is to start as early as possible to give students as much time with it as, as they can have, um, and also put it in their toolbox as early as possible as they you know, are doing things like applying for internships and whatnot. Um, and also to teach it as needed. So um, you know, teach the bits of it that are going to be helpful. If in a course students are working alone, then chances are they don't need to learn about March conflicts, then you don't need to teach them that. If they're working in teams, then you are going to want to teach them that. So you want to make sure that you're teaching this stuff early, but also when you can make time in your curriculum. And perhaps most importantly, if you are willing to integrate it through the curriculum. Having an introductory data science course that does you do some things um, you know, in Git repositories uh, for say 15 weeks or so, and then you never are required to use it again for another course in your undergraduate career is probably not going to um, give a whole lot of competency to students. This does require buy-in from multiple uh, faculty, clearly, right, in order to be able to weave it throughout the curriculum. But I think if you are able to do that, then you're going to see the real successes and students really appreciating the skills that they're learning. 
Um, so teach it to build good habits when the stakes are low, when, you know, the worst thing that can happen is you lose a homework question as opposed to your entire um, undergraduate thesis. I thought you would lose it, but, you know, people sometimes, I myself included, feel like, oh my God, if I press this button, I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and you motivated with... Uh, motivate not just reproducibility, this idea of going back in time, but also collaboration. Um, yes, you can go back to a prior commit in your Git history, and that might be a great way of recovering something you may have deleted. But in my experience, generally, students don't really like go back to another commit. They'll go to GitHub and they'll scroll through their earlier commits and find the thing that they know they deleted and copy and paste it because it is not that easy to go back into an earlier commit that does require a better understanding of how Git works. And that's okay. But what that means is that uh, saying that you should learn this just for reproducibility sometimes is not a strong enough sales pitch for the students to have buy-in. But if they are doing teamwork and are able to use that for collaboration, that's when they can uh, really see the strength of uh, being able to do that. And also it instills a practice of open sharing and helps them start to curate an online portfolio, which, um, you know, open sharing and homework assignments don't tend to go hand in hand. So I'll say something about that in a minute. But before uh, getting there, uh, let me show you kind of a screenshot that perhaps gets to the point about the, uh, the point I made about reproducibility, but also collaboration. Here's a real screenshot and the colors indicate different students um, whose names I have uh, or GitHub IDs I have redacted. And you can see what they're doing is the, they are working on their team project, all pushing to the same repository. And they are clearly addressing either issues that have been opened in this repository by themselves or by whoever gave them feedback, peer feedback, or myself as the instructor giving them feedback. And we can really see what they're working on. One of them is adding references, the other one's amending the code book, so on and so forth. And they're indicating clearly which issues they're closing. So this is you know, incredible transparency of who is doing what, which is, you know, might be useful from a grading perspective, but frankly, I think is incredibly useful for the students to see that that each other are explicitly working on certain things on the pro project, and they are clearly also interviewing their work um, and uh, potentially working either roughly at the same time or throughout the same day on the same repository. Um, the open sharing aspect, as I said, can be tricky. Um, you know, we're probably not going to be having our students post every single one of their homework assignments online for a variety of reasons. But particularly if you have an open ended project in your course, um, I would encourage you to think about allowing students to openly sharing that after they are done with the project. This is a practice I've been using over the last uh, few years that has been, I think, incredibly uh, successful slash um, kind of really welcome by the students who at the end of a semester want to have something more than just the course name uh, to put on their resume, for example. So at the end of each semester, once grading is done, and note that we don't put any grades themselves um, into the project repositories. We keep them away from there so they never make their way into their um, history. Um, and I ask the students something like this, dear team, whatever, uh, tell me if you're interested in um, opening up this. So can I, would you like to make this project public so that you can fork it and have it under your own profile on GitHub and you can continue to work on it or not, that's up to you. And also oftentimes I ask, can I use your project and feature it on the course website? Uh, particularly I do this if this is a new course that I know for the next semester students might be helpful for them to know. And if everybody says yes, um, then we go ahead and open things up and I walk them through the process of what it means to fork a project and how they can continue to work on it if they want to and how they might feature it on their GitHub profiles. Um, every once in a while, I'm a bit late uh, getting this issue up and um, without fail, a student will email me and say, hey, you had said we will be able to do this. When can we do this? Um, another superpower that 
has the same word on either side. And perhaps one of the most important ones is empathy. So what do I mean by empathy in the context of data science? Um, we bring a lot of data sets to the class. Sometimes we'll bring a data set, frankly, just to teach one function or just to teach a particular, um, you know, um, thing about the computing language that we're teaching them. And sometimes we bring that data set in because we're frankly trying to analyze it and make some sense of it. But regardless, um, I think it's important to strive to introduce the story with the data sets. Um, there's a really nice paper by Tanit Gebru et al called Data Sheets for Data Sets, where they recommend each data set be accompanied by what's called a data sheet that answers each of these questions. So this goes well beyond the traditional code book and questions like, for what purpose was the data set created? Does the data set contain data that might be considered confidential? Is it possible to identify individuals either directly or indirectly, either using just this data or in combination with other data. Were the individuals in question notified about the data collection? So these become additionally important if in fact, uh, this is a data set that has human data on it. Um, the paper is I think fantastic read that I would recommend. Um, it also has many, many, many questions for the data sheets that um, what I found is not always realistic for me to accompany every single data set that I bring to the classroom with. But each time I teach a class, I try to answer a few more of those in a readme file that goes along with the, um, the data set in the course resources. And ultimately, we can use this practice to motivate discussion around wider data science ethics issues like algorithmic bias, privacy, re-identification, so on and so forth. So do this early on, and then when it times come to an ethics module or something, you have something that you can reference back to that you've interviewed throughout your course or your curriculum. Um, I think another topic that goes well under this empathy is accessibility. So you could obviously teach a whole course or even a whole curriculum on accessibility that may not necessarily be in the cards. But at a minimum, I think it's important that your students not graduate without ever thinking or learning about it, particularly because they are generally creating artifacts for others to consume. And others, this audience is going to be have members um, with, um, you know, potentially different different accessibility concerns. And tooling exists among the tools that they already learn to accomplish what I would call the bare minimum that can go a long way in raising the next generation of data scientists who at least consider accessibility in their own work. So I'll give one very simple example here. Here is a uh, simple ggplot. I'm using that uh, penguins data set from the Palmer penguins package, and I am creating a scatter plot um, colored by species of the two variables. And you can see that I have a caption for my figure. Well, first of all, this is a data visualization and the caption will be screen reader friendly, but I have no information about what I'm actually seeing. So somebody uh, with visual impairments will not be able to see this, say a blind user. In addition, um, the default ggplot2 color scheme is not colorblind friendly, unfortunately. Um, so the species colors are not easy to make apart from each other and they're all represented by points, not shapes. So that makes things trickier. Um, so what could we do here? Well, using the same tooling as in I'm still in R, I'm still writing something like an R markdown document. Um, and in addition to a kit, uh, caption, I can add alt text. So I can actually add alt text that goes into the details of what we're seeing in this visualization. In addition, note that in the aesthetic mappings, I have not only mapped uh, species to color, but also shape and also used a different color scale from a different package called Color Blinder. So here is uh, the result, not very different, but three ways this differs from the default is we have taken the time to write an alternative, uh, alternative text that's going to be screen reader friendly. We have used colorblind friendly colors to distinguish the three species. And we have used not just colors, but also shapes to distinguish them as well. 
And last uh, superpower I'll discuss is self-sufficiency. In other words, learning on one's own. So what do I mean by this? I think you should wanna be sharing with your students how you learn and be specific about that. You know, do you read books? Do you look blog posts? Do you follow certain Twitter accounts? Um, share your practices with them so that they can uh, learn like you do. And also discuss with them how you choose what to learn. Um, demonstrating how you solve problems is also really, really helpful using practices like live coding. And finally, encourage them to take active part in the community, uh, uh, particularly if they're learning, you know, statistics and data science with R. There's a really, I think, warm and welcoming community to learn from and also smaller learning communities within that that the students might find a home in. All right, to wrap things up, a few superpowers for the educators power mimicry, or in other words, leveraging open source resources. Um, so I'll give you examples from the three things that I've worked on over the past year. Uh, Data Science in a Box is a project for kind of an open um, curriculum for introductory data science course. Um, uh, the uh, website in the middle is the STAT2 slash regression course that I've taught, that I've kind of inherited from my um, uh, colleague Maria Tackett, but added this um, notion of predictive modeling to it, um, and also taught a data visualization, advanced data visualization course. And the resources are all uh, open source for others to kind of grab as they wish, either learn from or use in their own teaching. So as I am wrapping up this talk, my call to action is in the chat, share an open educational resource that you've either created or reused. And please don't be shy. If you have resources to share, this is a great time to do so. And it could be, again, something you created or something you're, you've reused and appreciated. Um, the next one is knowledge projection, sharing knowledge with others. So yes, we talked about you can open source your course materials, but also write about your experiences if you're able to make the time to do so. Blog posts is one thing, but I think something that's wonderful about the statistics uh, kind of education publishing space is that um, we're able to publish about um, you know, uh, things that we try in our classroom, things that work and things that don't work um, in ways that might get traditional credits as well. So journal articles. If you are working on education related empirical studies, great. And you probably know exactly what you're doing and where that study is going to be submitted to. But also, um, you know, venues like the Journal of Stats and Data Science Education, accepts reflective essays, data sets and stories, or even brief communication. So um, if you haven't yet done so, take the step to um, kind of publish some of these things. I'll be very frank with you that um, earlier on in my career, I did not do this. Uh, I didn't even really think about this being an option and perhaps felt a little bit intimidated to do so. But I think with each thing that you publish, the next one becomes a lot easier. And it also becomes easier to find colleagues who are working on similar topics who might work with you on them. And finally, temporal status, which means pausing time. So making time to keep current. Um, this is probably impossible, so you can try, but it is probably impossible. But a few things that I'm learning and playing with nowadays to keep current is uh, things like transitioning to the native R pipe. So I've linked a blog post from which I've learned a lot by Isabella Velasquez on this. A new open source scientific and technical uh, publishing system called Quarto, which is basically next generation R Markdown that you'll probably hear me talk about a lot over the summer. And I've transitioned both my um, kind of creation of my materials and also teaching into. And um, there are, I think, uh, good tutorials to get started with um, at the Quarto website. Uh, I did exit interviews for our graduating seniors and every single one roughly said, why don't we have a database course in uh, our stats program? So I was thinking, oh, I don't really know much about databases. I don't know how I got this far in my life not doing so. So that's another thing I'm trying to skill up on a little bit. And finally, the wealth of resources that this conference is generating and particularly looking forward to digging into those on diversity, inclusion and the social justice track. And finally, I've talked about superpowers, but let's normalize being human, please. You don't have to learn everything. You don't have to teach everything. 
incremental changes over time are more than fine. Um, sometimes I find myself in this um, kind of vicious cycle as well, that I see new things popping up, features, packages, tools that's being discussed and hyped in the community. And I think something to recognize is that if it is, if they are being discussed, this is probably a good indication of their importance because they were probably requested, you know, feature requests that many people in the community have requested. So it's useful to have your ear open to them, but that doesn't mean you have to adopt them right away. Um, we don't want our courses going stale, but it doesn't mean you have to redesign your curriculum every single semester either. Um, I think there's really good content out there that we can iterate on without changing everything else. So thank you so much for listening. I think we have plenty of time for questions. And if you're interested in the slides, you can find them at bit.ly slash superpowers dash ECOTS 22. Um, in the next slide, I have some references, but I will uh, leave this link here for a second while I answer questions. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> you know, I really appreciated it. Um, if you do have questions, remember you can put them in the Q&A box. Um, so one of the first questions is about your superpower, which seems to be to know about the latest and greatest advances in R, tools, packages, et cetera. So the question is, is how do you learn or how do you, what's your strategy for um, learning about all these new features and new opportunities? Um, well, so I think uh, twofold. I do have, I, I really feel lucky that I have this, um, you know, part-time um, appointment with our studio. So I get to be in the trenches with uh, one of the teams that's the most prolific in terms of generating kind of new features and packages, which is a tidyverse team that I work on. Um, so there's that, but that's not a great answer. Um, however, um, what I would say is perhaps um, another way is I, I really do use Twitter a lot to keep up with stuff. And another one is this newsletter called Our Weekly uh, that comes, I want to say every Monday. It's once a week only, which is a lot better than Twitter. And there are many stretches of days that I can't kind of uh, take Twitter, frankly. And so I don't want it to be the only way that I um, kind of keep up with things. Um, but I would say that that R Weekly is a, a great one for learning about what's new in R. Um, for in terms of learning about what's happening in the education area in general, um, I try to also kind of follow the work on people who tend to be prolific about um, you know, either traditional publications, but also who are really uh, kind of generous with the materials that they create, particularly teaching materials that they create. So if I see somebody, um, you know, sharing something like that, say on Twitter, my first reaction is to retweet it so that more people get to see it, but also to start following them to see what else they might be coming up with. Um, so most of the time, that is my way of getting into things. And the other thing I would say is, I somehow do enjoy kind of reading documentation and folks put a lot of effort into reading, uh, writing documentation. And there tends to be nice gems and links into other things that you might dive into there. Um, and, you know, I'll be honest, I don't read the documentation when I'm frustrated. I fall into the same trap my students fall into. But otherwise, when I'm trying to learn, I really enjoy reading it. Um, it looks like in the chat, there is, say. Um, yeah, I, I can, uh, I'll try to, um, yeah. If you could put the I'll link try in the to chat, we can that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, it looks like this is um, working. So maybe I had, So this opened up for me. If it's not opening up, is that the link that's not opening up for others? It says speaker um, deck not found when I try to. Okay, it. let me see if I can click one button um, to do that. And then you can try one more time, but that should be the correct um, uh, link. Okay. Um, so while you're doing that, um, we do have another question question. Which yeah, like please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, please go ahead. So the question is, is, do you have any suggested resources to learn more about accessibility? 
Yeah, so there are actually um, there are actually um, some really nice write ups um, lately, particularly that are linked in, um, I would say, in the readme for the Tidy Tuesday repo. So if you go there, there are a couple links to really nice write ups about um, um, uh, how to write alternative text. So that one is focused on alternative text, uh, but I would say that, that that is a good place to look at. Um, um, and I've learned a lot from it. I've been writing a lot of alternative text lately as working on a new book project, and I've learned a lot from how to phrase things from there. Um, another place I'll, I'll kind of like, say this off because it's a long list of resources, but one of the things I linked in my slide deck was my visualization course materials. And actually we did a full module on accessibility there and there are lots and lots of links. So if you go to the website for the visualization course, which is visdata.org and look for the accessibility materials there. You'll get to things about kind of checking for color blindness, uh, our packages that are designed specifically for that. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that this is a very narrow view of accessibility. There's a lot more to it than what's covered in the data visualization course, both in terms of data visualization, but also broadly as well. Um, another resource that I have found useful is the trainings that my university provides, frankly. Um, our library, our librarians um, have a few accessibility experts uh, on staff, and they've been doing these uh, kind of seminars that I've tried to either attend or follow up with um, on Zoom after, on recordings after. So your university might have similar resources that I would very much encourage you to um, take advantage of. actually have a question. What is the motivation yeah. for moving to the native pipe from the Magritte package pipe? Um, so what is the motivation? So I think the biggest motivation is that, um, why not? You know, the biggest motivation is um, clearly um, the, um, we have, um, the our core has decided that hey this is a useful thing for people to have um, available to them uh, with basar without having to add a new package so personally my um concern isn't necessarily package dependencies or anything i think that's the reason why our core added this uh, functionality to be able to minimize package de dependencies so others can build packages and write code that rely on the piping um, kind of uh, thought process without having to load a new package. That's not my concern. But the fact that it is available makes me think, why not first try to learn about it? And then once you've learned about it, actually start teaching it as well. Um, I will say that the blog post that I linked and the slides should be working right now if you would. Um, um, if you would, if you want to go back to that same link, they should be uh, working right now. Um, the blog post that I linked on the slides goes into the details about a couple places where the two pipes differ. And so far in my investigation um, of my course materials, that has not been a problem, though I haven't finished converting everything yet. Um, I'm working on the second edition of R for Data Science uh, with Hadley Wickham, and we've converted the entire book to use the, uh, the native R pipe, and that was almost a drop in replacement. Um, so I feel pretty confident that it will be a drop in replacement. It is one less character to type at a minimum. And the idea is that now the code that you're writing, um, even if students find themselves in a situation where they do need to be wary of um, kind of package dependencies, they can still use the pipe thought process, which for me is both um, easier to read, easier to teach, and seems to be very much welcome from students. Great, thank you. Um, those are the questions we have in the Q and A. Um, are there? And I'm checking to see if there's any other questions in the chat. Uh, there was one about changing our studio or like things like error message colors and things like that, which I believe can be changed just in the R Studio global options. You can kind of pick your themes and colors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but here's a couple other questions coming through. Uh, what yeah. is a good resource for learning about tidy models? 
Yeah, so I would say that the Tidy Models uh, website, so tidymodels.org, has a um, the Get Started uh, resource, which has four extensive write-ups. And I would say that that is a get great resource to learn about Tidy Models in the sense that for you to decide, is this an ecosystem I want to explore more? Is this something that I feel like, you know, works with my sensibilities of how I want to think about modeling. I would say that those four tutorials at um, like tidymodels.org slash get started um, is a great place to uh, start. If your answer is yes, my recommendation would be to then move on to the Tidy Modeling with our book uh, by Max Kuhn and Julia Silge, which is available online freely and I think in print either already or soon, um, and then to dig deeper into that. And I do believe somebody put the um, the book you yeah. just mentioned mm -hmm. in the chat, so that is there. Um, a quick question: When will the new R for Data Science book be ready? Um, end of the year should be finishing writing calendar year. So, um, um, and then sometime in the next academic year, I. As a notoriously open source publisher, I don't know anything about traditional publishing things, but it is, um, you know, it will be available down online. And actually, if you go to the current, um, like the first edition uh, page now, that will continue to be live. But we also link to the uh, working progress second edition if you would like to read through as we go along. Um, with each of the chapters, we have a banner that says the the condition of the chapter, whether it's an active development are pretty stable. So if you were thinking you would ask students to read that, I would recommend paying attention to the banner and not assign something that's in like, this is changing every day sort of thing. Um, we're almost out of time here, I believe. <laughs> uh, but one quick question, any advice for first year faculty, um, especially those maybe teaching a course that would incorporate for this, this for the first time, especially incorporating these new ideas or sort of the scope of things. Yeah, I think my biggest advice would be, um, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be somewhat contradictory. One, don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel for an entire semester long course. But at the same time, I think that if I was teaching for the first time as a first year faculty, and I was just like reusing everything someone else created, I don't know how I would find joy in that. Therefore, I would say, take a look at existing resources. If you are teaching something like data science, data science course in a box is one resource, but there are others as well. Um, and then take a look to see which are a few modules that you are you know, excited about and you wanna say, I wanna make these my own, but I know that for things I may not have time for or for things where I feel like what's already been done agrees very well with how I think about it, I will borrow those. Um, other advice, don't, make, don't commit to making a semester long of videos if you can avoid it. I think, but I mean, I know that some of us can't avoid this, but I would say that that's probably one of the hardest thing to get right. If you have influx materials, I would say if things are, you know, very stable, then great. But if you are teaching for the first time, I would say be either don't make videos or be okay with them not being great. And then the second time you teach it, you can think about making them like, you know, um, well established videos. All right. We're at time. I believe there is one last question. I don't know if we can squeeze it in, Megan. <laughs> but the answer is uh, there's no reason not to, Scott. So right. yes, you should right. switch. Yes. <laughs> so the switch from carrot to tidy model. can no switch, let me to. say. Not right. necessarily you should, but you very well can and no reason yeah. not to. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome.